Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is uh, Robin Ayub from the Localization Fireside Chat. I'm the founder of the channel. Uh, it's an independent channel uh, that is uh, specifically dedicated for the localization conversation. And uh, if you haven't done so already, we would appreciate if you can uh, engage with our content on YouTube, in podcast, etc. We'd appreciate your support by liking and sharing the comment. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, we do these conversation once or twice a week. Uh, they're very important conversation in a transformative time that we're going through as an industry. And we're focusing a lot on uh, technological advancement. We're focusing a lot on transformation. And this is part of our conversation today. And I'm glad and I have the honor to be joined by uh, Bruno Hermann. And Bruno uh, is a well-known um, uh, consultant and a leader in our industry. Uh, they specialize in scale-ups and multilinguals. Uh, also, uh, Bruno have held several key positions with several key large companies that um, uh, that has, and I let him talk a little bit about himself here in a bit of an intro. I won't do him justice in doing his bio. He's more interested in uh, interesting when he says it uh, and telling his story. Now, for those of you who are interested in another conversation I've done with Bruno on this channel, Please go back to our uh, previous episodes that we've recorded with uh, Bruno. It was a very interesting conversation. It was my first conversation with Bruno. So first, welcome, Bruno, to our channel. Welcome to the conversation. Nice to have you with us. How are things in Belgium? Thanks, Robin. Thanks for having me. Uh, things in Belgium are good, uh, except the weather, but that's usual. It rains, so no worries about that. And uh, I'm really glad that uh, we have this Second conversation, just to dive deeper into some very exciting topics. So you mentioned about my story. So my story actually started 30 years ago uh, when I, you know, I had my first jobs as a project manager and uh, as a linguist in translation localization agencies. So I started just 30 years ago this year. So this is my birthday in a way. Um, and so I, I spent quite a number of interesting years in the, in at that time, of course, because uh, translation localization was also, you know, um, more important, became more important uh, with the development of the Internet. So it was a very, very, uh, I would say, um, uh, exciting time at, uh, just to be in, in, in those agencies. And, uh, you know, I wanted to start the new century. So in 2000, I joined the, the client side of the localization industry. So that's why I say that I still belong uh, to the localization community, but I've not always been in the localization industry, which is for me, uh, suppliers and, and providers. So in 2000, as I said, I moved to the client side of the industry. Uh, I started working for a, a, a big uh, tech company uh, that was called at that time Compaq, and then uh, it was uh, acquired by HP. So I spent several years at HP, very exciting times as well with a big, uh, tech multinational. Um, and then uh, in 2003, I moved to another industry, no longer the tech industry, but it was the market research and business intelligence industry. And I spent 15 years at a company uh, called uh, Nielsen. At that time, it was, called, it was called Nielsen. And I spent 15 years, which I never thought I would be doing, but I did it because there was so much to do in terms of product management, marketing management, but also uh, content management, and I probably I can refer to some of that experience during the conversation. And uh, you know, after 15 years, I uh, started my consultancy, which I interrupted to go and work for another industry again, <laughs> uh, life science, uh, working for a big uh, CRO, which is uh, Acuvia. And uh, and then uh, a few few months ago, I moved back to my consultancy after a great experience at Acuvia. Uh, and I'm currently a consultant and advisor for people who are willing to expand internationally uh, and digitally. Well, excellent. And thanks for the uh, absolutely marvelous uh, uh, you know, journey through your career and how you got here. Uh, and very impressive. Um, and I'm very happy to be having a conversation with you today on today's topic, which is the, uh, the topic of the hour that we're going to be discussing today. It's all about business integration and value-driven and inclusive AI deployment. And that was the topic of our uh, webinar that we scheduled a few weeks ago. And I want to thank, while I'm, while, I, while I'm on the topic, I want to thank the 580 registrant 
that we have for this webinar. And I want to mention also for some people who are registered for the webinar, if you can't make it to the webinar, we are recording this webinar, which will be uh, broadcasted again, will be posted on our um, uh, localization fireside channel on YouTube and all the podcast uh, sites as well. So if you missed it now, this conversation will be recorded and you can't miss it. You can, you can always have the opportunity to go and view it. Uh, thanks again for everybody who registered. We welcome you to the channel, welcome you to the conversation today. Uh, as we go through the conversation, Brewer and I, and if you are watching us on uh, LinkedIn uh, live, uh, you, if you have a comment, if you have a question, please put them in the comment section in the LinkedIn live section. And uh, Bruno and I will be reading those comments and we'll respond to your questions accordingly. So thanks again for everybody. Let's dive in. The first on the, uh, on the, on the agenda, uh, if you don't mind, Bruno, is AI mm -hmm. implementation and adoption. And we talk, about the, we talk about AI implementation and adoption in a tone or in a context that it's not as similar as to what we've done before in other technologies. It's not like deploying Windows, the latest window, the latest window uh, version, or it's not like deploying SAP or some other technology that, although it was transformative, but not to the level of AI right now. And, and I, know, I know you have a lot of opinion on the matter. So let's get started by putting a context around deployment of AI first, and then we'll, 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 we'll dive into the rest of the topics. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, AI is a game changer. Uh, it's not the first one, but it's more probably more profound and more extended than previous game changers uh, in, in multiple ways, because you mentioned, of course, implementation and ad implementation and adoption. Uh, and we see already today, uh, because last year, probably many people were uh, in the rapids of AI. So they were playing with it. They were you know, uh, using it more or less for uh, for themselves. They were piloting it sometimes. But this year, in my opinion, and it seems to be confirmed by some experience that I'm having now, uh, it's going to be the year of implementation and value and also inclusion. inclusion. And uh, a few weeks ago, thanks, Robin, for uh, displaying this, this quote. A few weeks ago, I found this quote on LinkedIn, uh, and I... You know, I said to myself, I wish I could have said that myself because it really contains what, you know, the challenge and the opportunity with AI is all about. Uh, and if you read that quote, you are going to say, yeah, of course, this is something that we see today. But, you know, uh, Tidal is using keywords, which I think should be in the strategy, AI driven strategy of any organization. When you read that, you know, uh, there is a demand for new mindsets, tool sets, skill sets, and upskilling. You have here with those keywords, you have exactly, in my opinion and in my experience currently with my, with my clients, the combination that is going to make, uh, you know, um, AI value driven and inclusive, which is the people, the humans, the operations, so the processes, uh, the workflows and technology. So you have those three major components. And of course, the, the challenge and the opportunity at the same time is how to balance and how to combine these, you know, components between humans, uh, processes and technology. Uh, because of course, you know, uh, you, you might put that in any strategy, but you still have to make sure that first of all, it creates value because that's exactly what some organizations uh, couldn't do last year because it was so hype and so so exciting that you know people wanted to use it and wanted to play with it so yes now it's time to you know link it to value creation value creation for the business and value creation for the customers so we'll we'll talk about that a bit later and also to make it inclusive i insist on this word as well because you know we've seen that in in previous stages of digital transformation sometimes there is a divide or there are some people left behind or not really in, engaged in the change. And I think AI to be successful will not only depend on technology, as I said before, but will depend on people, humans, up downstream for implementation and uh, for, um, uh, for uh, adoption, which is uh, key, but also, you know, upstream. When, when, it, when people need to actually make sure that data uh, feeding and training AI is going to be right, is going to be relevant. So humans are going to be important 
uh, across the day, across or throughout the AI journey. So it's not going to be, you know, one or the other. It's going to be, sorry, it's going to be the one and the other. So that's really, uh, there is no or for me in, in the strategy. So I really love this quote for that reason, because it summarizes what, you know, people in charge of AI driven strategies or simply of AI uh, evangelism should be really uh, have in mind that it's all going, is going to be really uh, a combination of uh, mindset, tool sets, and skill sets. That's really important. Absolutely. And and the other, yeah, and and the other the other thing that you you touched on, uh, Robin, is of course that it's profound because everybody and I read a very a very interesting article a few days ago about that. There is an expectation in most organizations deploying AI that the the training curve is going to be longer with AI than it was with other te technologies before. So we have to be ready for that. And uh, obviously, this is this relates again to the human side of AI, which is inclusion, and the business side, which is value creation. So before probably we dig too far down uh, down the road in the topics that we have to discuss today, Bruno, uh, and, and mm -hmm. you know, just a reminder for our listeners and our audience, this is a fireside chat again. So Bruno and I will ask itself ask ourselves questions, answer them, take answer, take questions from the audience, etc. So. Um, it is not a, a one way conversation. It's a, it's a bit more a, a give or take between two individuals who loves this topic and would love to engage on the, in the conversation on this topic. So one of the obvious things before we dive into it, and it's on everybody's mind, is it, uh, and, and I'd love to get your, your take on this. Is it mm -hmm. the, your idea or is it your understanding? Where are, where are you on the thought that says, are we exaggerating the benefit of AI too early or are we on par? Are we behind? Where are we? In the, because I'm noticing conversations around AI that I think ahead of ourselves a little bit, I feel. That's my personal feeling. Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and I'm afraid there is no single answer to, to your question because it depends uh, on where you are, uh, on which type of organization you are, on which industry you are. Uh, so it always depends on, on business factors on, or on business objectives for that matter, uh, that can be kind of, that can be quite different depending on the industry. Uh, I think my personal, if I had to give, anyway, if I, if I have to give you one answer, one unified answer to your, to your question, I would say that, uh, we are in, in, in the beginning of the journey. So we are not sort of uh, down the road yet. We are in the beginning. As I said last year, it was the year of excitement and hype. This year, I see more and more uh, cases uh, and examples of, uh, you know, business driven, value driven um, uh, experiments or even, you know, implementation. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, we, the, the, the other thing which is very challenging with AI is that what you and I were going to talk about today might be outdated next month because everything is changing so fast. Then, you know, what we are saying today might be outdated and not even next month. It might be outdated next week. So this is, of course, why I would consider just to be on the safe side and just to be on the pragmatic side that we are in the, on, on the beginning, in the beginning uh, of the journey. And the benefits that we see today are probably just, uh, you know, a, a limited number of benefits. Just because this journey is going to last for some time, uh, you know, also from a human side and from a technology side. But, you know, we, we are going to talk about that a bit later. But really what I, what I would like to avoid for myself and for the people I'm working with is that we run before being able to walk, if you know what I mean. Okay. So that's, that's a mistake that I've seen many times before, not just for AI, by the way, but for other type of, um, you know, uh, ch big major changes is that some people, some organizations, sometimes they, they rush uh, and they sort of have to make steps back, which is even more cost and time, uh, which is even less, by the way, sorry, which is even less cost and time effective because, you know, when you make a step back, you have to, of course, spend more time and more money. Mm -hmm. And AI is very expensive. So we know that AI. So for that, for that reason as well, I would sort of be, you know, cautious, uh, but of, I would be, I would say, um, uh, dynamically cautious so that, you know, when there is an opportunity, let's do it. Let's target some quick wins. Let's make sure that we can demonstrate the benefits, 
because I know some people are uh, still skeptical or pushing back. So it's important uh, also to demonstrate uh, and to deliver on the promises. So, you know, to a lot of people, like especially in the localization industry, when they hear the word AI, I guess we need to put some context on what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So when they hear the word AI, they automatically thinking, oh, I've got MT, so I've got machine translation, I should be fine now. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, this is a big misconception that, uh, AI is in everything we do, and and I if, and I need your help on putting some context around it, like some example application where this is thing is going to be taken, not taken over, but it's going to be like I would call it like a droid um, a support beside me. So if I'm, you know, if I'm a, uh, you know, I've seen those. Uh, if somebody plays video games, when you fly in a, when you fly in a video game airplane, you have an and you have a droid beside you supporting you, You're the mm -hmm. pilot. But there's a droid beside you that's helping you, thinking like you, behaving like you almost, and it's supporting your action. It's supporting your your whatever you're trying to do. Um, it is a big misconception, in my opinion, in my personal opinion, to think of AI as a machine translation. Well, maybe this machine translation is where it started, but it's now it's much beyond that. Can you put some context around some of the applications? Sure, and and uh, you're absolutely right. We probably should frame. Uh, you know, some of our discussion today around generative AI, you know, which is because AI has multiple branches, but I think for today, generative AI is really what, what is going to be more, most interesting for the audience. And, um, well, in terms of application, I would say that, uh, it, it has to be applications where, uh, in my opinion, again, and my, and my experience, uh, where AI is really seen as a companion, as a, as an assistant. Uh, of course, not as a replacement. That's the most dangerous thing to do is consider that, you know. And I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people now are are breathing the sigh of relief when you say it's not a replacement because a lot of people oh, no, think no, no, that it's no, a replacement. Never. Well, and, and this is, this is I mean, in my opinion, this is why, you know, a number of people are reluctant or skeptical about AI is because there are, there are some fears. Uh, some people just see, you know, the opportunities. Some people see the... The challenges, um, I prefer to see the opportunities, but I don't ignore the challenges. So I would say that uh, in terms of applications, you're right to say that in the content industry or in the localization industry, AI is not a new thing. Machine translation is there to show it. You know, uh, it started years ago, years and years ago. So this, the content industry and the localization industry have a benefit, have a, I would say, have an advantage. Uh, compared to other industries where AI is new or is more recent. So I think that uh, for people who are in those industries, uh, there is really a card to play, uh, an important card to play, which is the experience that has been built with machine translation uh, or with other type of AI-driven uh, content uh, tools. And I think that uh, also there is a way to sort of, um, well, ease the anxiety by, you know, um, linking uh, or explaining first and then linking uh, what AI will do, for instance, you know, uh, what, what it will do, what it, what, it, what it will improve in terms of, you know, uh, multilingual content generation, multilingual content uh, creation, multilingual content uh, validation. I think, you know, there is a parallel that I could make here between what you know, AI brought to another industry, which I know quite well, which is BI. It's just one letter of difference, right? Business intelligence. I spent 15 years of my life in a BI company and I worked with data scientists. I work with data management people and I was watching and of course working with them. And I, I observed what they were doing in terms of you know, um, improving uh, data management with more automation, more and more automation. You know, more, of course, it went through several stages like RPA for those who know what data management is. Uh, and of course, I can do, I can make a parallel now with what the, lo the content and the localization industries can do with it, which is to say, we have a number of activities. We have a number of tasks to perform for ourselves and for our clients. So what, how can we stay relevant? How, how can we be creating value uh, for, you know, for these clients or for our organizations? And I think that um, 
there is a way to say that, well, um, if you think about, for instance, multilingual content generation, uh, there is still today a question in some organizations I know, which is, do we still keep managing multilingual content with a TMS, with machine, uh, with, uh, with uh, translation memories, with uh, machine translation, or do we move to some sort of post post TMS area? And I think, you know, the answer is quite complicated because it depends on many factors. But I think that if you identify, if you are in the localization industry or the content industry, if you can identify some wins in terms of productivity, in terms of safety sometimes, in terms of speed, then you can really target uh, where AI is going to be important. And I can give an example for for instance, uh, multilingual content validation. So today in the number of workflows you have, of course, you know, the translation, the localization, and you have a QC, QA phase. If you are leveraging AI for the validation phase, so the QC and QA, you still have human beings involved as what I call personally language supervisors or language creators, uh, sorry, language, language curators. But they work with AI because they can work much faster. They can work, they can use AI to check the amount of content more quickly than just themselves doing it, I would say, on, on a more, on a more traditional basis, on a more human basis. And that's where AI becomes the companion of the human, where the human can really tap into the benefit, one benefit of AI, which is speed, which is the processing of information. And it, the human can apply that to the task of checking content in multiple languages. And AI will help this, uh, what I call again, language curator or language supervisor detect issues and correct issues. Uh, and of course, the benefit will still be there because the person keeps his job as, you know, as, as a checker of, of content, but it does it better and faster thanks to AI. This is just one example. And I want to thank uh, Don De Palma, who just sent us a uh, little note on our stream here. Uh, and I want to make a make a comment on this one. CSA Research have been characterizing uh, since 2016 um, AI as a uh, to augment, to help, to support, to be a droid, as as he as he mentioned my my uh, my comment that I just mentioned earlier. So thanks thanks Don for that comment. Really appreciate it. Very timely. And uh, yeah, absolutely. It is to augment and just to calm people down. Uh, your jobs are going to be evolving, not, and we'll talk into, we'll, we'll get, dig into the people aspect of AI deployment in a second here, but it's about ev yeah. the evolvement of, 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 of the jobs and the evolution of our profession and how we do work and how do we, you know, I'm thinking about it as a huge transformation for my career, for my job, for what I do, um, in terms of content creation, in terms of, content validation in terms of, you know, reaching out and producing more content in a, in a, in a timely manner uh, for my job, for my personal work that I do versus, you know, replacing me. Um, I'm still need to be involved. I'm still need to be um, um, directing the action, if you will. Uh, but there is a huge, like, I mean, for the amount of individuals who signed up for this, uh, for this, for this event, and some of them I've known and I've talked to before, and some of them have expressed, you know, the fear of AI replacing people. And I'm hoping that this conversation today will reduce that fear. And I'm hoping this conversation today will encourage you to learn uh, AI, work with AI, and and help you support you in your job uh, down the road. So let's let's talk about the people aspect of uh, of, of AI, if you don't mind, uh, Bruno. And a and a bunch of things that we talked about over the time you and me. You know, we talked about productivity, creativity, professional development, all that aspect of it. Can you touch on the people aspect of of, of deploying AI, and what do we need to do to make sure that our people are more productive, more creative, using another tool that it, to their advantage. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Well, th there is quite a lot of work, in my opinion, to, to do, um, which is good news in a way, because it means that, you know, uh, humans are more than ever important. I, I keep saying that, you know, for me, an AI-driven strategy should be a people-first strategy. I, I know that some people look at me in a very strange way because they think that this is, 
this is not making sense, but I think it makes sense to say that AI driven goes together with people first. People first, why? Because people are the first ones, humans are the first ones in the supply chain uh, driven by AI. It's the people who are managing data. And, you know, uh, and, and it starts with humans and it ends with humans because the people who are going to get the content, except, of course, in some cases, which are, you can, you can of course, imagine some content from machine to machine, but th these are very specific cases. But at the beginning and at the end of the chain, the supply chain, there are humans and they're in the middle as well. But AI still is, is in the middle. W one thing that I would say is, of course, I can use the term that is uh, in the quote, which is upskilling. Upskilling is going to be very important. Uh, upskilling means, and I had a great experience with one, one company last year, uh, because upskilling seems to mean, uh, when you read that, that you know you need to add some skills. You need to make people more, uh, more aware, uh, more performing uh, with you know some tools, with some concepts, etc. Mm -hmm. But I realized last year something that I was suspecting, which was, which is that. Upskilling means more than just adding skills. It means re, re, relearning skills and unlearning skills. Sometimes you have to unlearn what you learned five or 10 years before. Um, so upskilling is, is a big task because you need to identify exactly what those people will need. You know, marketing people, communication people, product management people. Uh, they all have, of course, a, a job description and you need to really look into you know, their objectives and, and sort of uh, calibrate the upskilling effort according to that. Uh, the other thing that I would uh, highlight, and this is based on my experience, uh, based um, based on my experience with Nielsen. Uh, as I said before, I, I worked uh, during 15 years with data scientists. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, it was not always easy because it was not really my background, data management, but I, I, I enjoyed it eventually because I learned quite a lot. And I think that uh, in, in a number of cases, it is good for some organizations having data scientists to train or to uh, foster collaboration efforts between you know, their data scientist team, if they have one, and their language teams, if they have, or their language suppliers, if they have as well. So that there is this collaboration between data expertise, which is data science, and language expertise, which is language industry. And then you have this combination, which I personally uh, think that it's going to be quite critical in, num in a number of industries, between two expertises that need to really work together. And that's really, that need to deliver the value that I was talking about before. And the reason why I mentioned this is because uh, years ago, I remember in 2016, or oh, 15, sorry, 2015, I started presenting when I was at Nielsen about something that was not very popular at that time. And I mentioned in all my presentations that I felt that my company and other companies were going to be more um, uh, working focused on uh, content services and data services than language services. And some people cried at me and they said, but bro, what are you saying? You know, language, the language industry is there, it's going to survive. And I said, I didn't say that the language industry was not going to survive. I said that content and data services are going to become more important and that for people in the language services or in the language technology industry, it should be more valuable to be fitting nicely into this new, this new um, requirement of content and data services. So my message was not to say that, you know, translation, localization was going to disappear. I was just going, I was just trying to say that that translation, localization and, and all language expertise tasks will be integrated gradually uh, in the what is what is, uh, into a concept that is well known for everybody, which is the content supply chain. You have the creation of the content and you have the delivery, and in between you have a number of different activities. And I said this this content supply chain is going to be driven by content and data services, and for people in the language services, your future is going to be in this supply chain, working with other people, creating content, testing content. 
you know, designing content for UX people, for instance. And at that time, you know, I was not very popular because I was ahead of your time. That. Ahead of your time, Bruno. <laughs> Yeah, I was a bit ahead of my time. So, and uh, and I'm glad because you mentioned Don De Palma. Uh, I saw a great presentation from Don and his uh, his team last year, at the end of last year, when he said that now we are in the post localization era. We are in the content services area. And I said, "Wow, great! I wish I wish Don could That's have right. could have done this right. presentation in 2015." But uh, absolutely, yeah. and and you know, you bring up a very uh, very good topic, which is. Um, the post uh, the post era that we are in and what is that going to look like and you know I always I always think about that because it's uh, with the, because once you understand the capability of the technology and you understand that we are pretty much on um, the ground floor right now maybe a little maybe a little above the ground floor but we're not really at the top yet in terms of adopting the technology harnessing the technology taking advantage of what the technology can do for us you can see down the road you know the possibility right so if i was like and, and going back to people if i was a i don't know project manager if i was an architect if i was a um a, if i was a translator i'll be focusing in 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 correct me if i'm wrong i should be focusing on learning ai to increase my output if i was in if i was a project manager or a translator i mean we still work in an industry it's pretty much in the legacy world if you if i will if, if i can use that characterization but you know, we still think like metrics, right? So one of the metrics is, you know, output per translator per day, still some, you know, and in the industry standard still around, you know, between 1800 to 2000 words a day. Now, I'm assuming, you know, by adopting the new technologies, and if you want to differentiate yourself as a translator, you know, one would say, and one would, you know, conclude or deduct from all this, that your standard productivity per day are much higher than somebody who's using a legacy methods to do the translation. If you're a project manager and you're using AI, you can increase your, you know, the amount of communication you're doing internally, externally effective communication. You can generate ideas on how to reach out to people. You can read, you can do a lot more summarization of your reports that you want to send to your customers. Uh, there's a lot more application you can engage as a project manager to do a lot more with a less effort. So the implication here is at, at the, you know, from the, from today until like whenever people learn, and, and again, depends on the individual, depends on the, you know, people ability to learn and adapt. I'm not saying this will be equal to everybody, far from be it. People learn on their own, you know, on their own schedule, on their own ability. And people do with, uh, with the technology uh, what their ability allows them to do with the technology, right? So some people are afraid of it. They don't want to learn it. Some people, they absorb it like me. I stay up all night trying to figure out what to do next with this thing. But <laughs> but some people are just afraid yeah. of it. No, and, and it's that's a great point. And I would say that uh, for, the, for the people side of AI, but also for the, the process side and, and the technology side, there is one thing that is quite important, which is, as I said before, is, is not to run before being able to walk. And one thing that I noticed last year as well, I, and I still notice today the same thing, but probably it's going to be uh, less, less obvious now, um, that some organizations, because of AI uh, promises, they want to go to implementation and adoption too quickly or too far sometimes. And you know, one thing, one 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 thing that I do all the time when I work on projects or programs for uh, for clients is that I want them to really understand that this this phase of implementation adoption is what I call the effectiveness phase. Before that, for me, there are two crucial phases. There is the audit phase where you actually just make the assessment of what you have or what you don't have today. And again, in terms of human resources, processes, and technology. Once the audit is done, completed, then you move to what I call the readiness phase. How can you make yourself and your organization ready for what's going to be down the line, down the downstream, which is going to be implementation and adoption? And this is the critical phase, because of course, if you, if you skip one, or if you don't meet one of, one of those requirements to be ready, ready, not effective yet, just to be ready, with your AI strategy or AI driven strategy, you're going to probably, uh, you know, move directly to implementation. You, you might have to make some steps back because you realize that, you know, you miss, uh, some skills in your, in your teams. 
too bad. You have to do it and you have to go back. You miss, you missed some, some uh, new processes to include in your workflow. Too bad. You have to go back to your workflow and change it. And same thing for your technology. If you look at your tech stack and if you, if you, if you see that there is no feature or no tool dedicated to content and data services, you have to go back to your ecosystem and adapt it. So I think the readiness phase, including, of course, KPIs that you have to, of course, implement uh, to, to, to evaluate your ready, the, the, you know, your, your readiness for AI is very important to actually complete before moving to the implementation and adoption. And I would say it's most of all critical for humans in this, in this picture, because of course, if there is no readiness that has been evaluated and, you know, validated, obviously, you know, humans who are going to be in the implementation and the adoption phase might just be lost and might be fear and, and they might have fears, they might be pushed back. And this is where you have those feelings of, this is not for me, or, you know, this is going to silently kill my job, etc. So if the readiness stage is really taken more seriously, I think you can really reduce the level of anxiety. Yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, you bring up a very good point because, uh, you, you need to get people on board with the idea first, right? So you need to sell them on the idea first. And one of the things that, you know, you just mentioned earlier here in a second here, when you said, you know, uh, this is going to kill my job, uh, because you hear a lot, you know, why should I work with AI? I'll be training AI on how to do my job. And the next thing I know is AI is taking over my job. So. There, there's, yeah. you know, those are legitimate concerns. Those are legitimate fear. Uh, people are, ex people are exhibiting out there. Is it true? I don't think so. Personally, I don't think so. Um, is it going to help you? Of course, it's going to help you. Like everything in life has got pros and cons. And, you know, mm -hmm. I feel AI has got a lot more, pro more pros than, than, than there's cons to it. Now, the key here is our ability to shift our thinking as a human being when it comes to AI. Because this is not MS Word, this is not Windows, this is a little bit more sophisticated in the way we are going to deal with this technology. And the future is AI, and not AI in terms of replacing human. This is not some sort of a, you know, matrix where, you know, the machine's going to take over and all of a sudden we're going to be vegetables. <laughs> Sorry to use that, but we're, this is not the case at all. This is complete miscommunication by somebody. I don't know who, but this is a let's work together a tool that it's very sophisticated, that if it's used right, it's going to help us greatly. And one of the things you talked about is, uh, you know, we alluded to, but we didn't really dig deeper into is the process. So what is the yeah. process, in your opinion, to walk through this? This is, of course, uh, as critical as the human side of, of AI-driven uh, strategies. I mean, uh I will give you, I, I will use one example to, to, to make my point because I think that it's, it's so obvious that everyone can relate to it. Uh, last year I was working with an organization uh, that was really uh, more than eager to implement AI and they said they made decisions before I started working with them to really, you know, mm -hmm. go and start implement, implementing some new AI processes. Uh, they changed, of course, their supply chain, their content or their product supply chain. Um, and I said, yes, okay, um, I see the changes, but in my opinion, you are missing some changes in your new, I mean, so-called AI-driven supply chain. And they said, why? And I said, well, it's because, you know, I look at your supply chain, at your workflow, and I see just that you put, you, you infused AI at some, at some stages. And my question to you is, you know, what is, what is your expected output? And nobody was able to tell me any sort of output that was going to be more or less expected because nobody thought about that. Everybody thought about, you know, in, in integrating AI as, as quickly as possible to be, to be in, in, as I said before, to be in the rapids of AI. And I think that I always remember this sentence and I, and I created an article on LinkedIn with that title. And that, that person said to me, but Bruno, we have millions of files. We're going to train our AI engine with these files. I said, you don't feed and you don't train AI with files. You do it with data. So have you thought about the conversion of your assets, which are files, text files, video files, audio files, 
Have you thought about what you are going to do in your supply chain to first convert your assets into data, language data, text data, other types of data that will actually then feed and train your AI engine that will actually be used to create your language model, etc. And everybody was looking at me and said, no, ah, it's too bad, because in your, in your adapted and so-called AI workflow, you should have thought about the difference between the previous, the, 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 you know, the pre-AI stage where, or the pre-AI mm -hmm. era, where you know, people were using, were transactioning files. I sent you my file. Can you put it? Can you translate it into uh, into German? Then I get the files back, and I I will send the file to to a linguist for for QC, etc. So it was before. In most cases, it was a, a workflow. These were workflows based on the transaction of files, and now is based on flows of data, which makes a difference. So you have to replace. You, the, the, the part of your supply chain that was based on transactioning files, you have to replace that with managing data flows, data sets. And there was nothing there. So I spent, I don't know, four months, but probably close to four, uh, five, sorry, just to look at their supply chain and define what needed to be done to change the process that was called content creation because there was like a, you know, a huge part of the workflow that was dedicated to content creation, and that was right, but it was just based on, you know, a, 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 an old process used to, you know, work with files, PowerPoint, P, uh, PDF, etc., and not being usable with AI. So the conversion and all the tasks related to, day, uh, you know, data management like annotation, curation, etc. These tasks were not even in the workflow. So I said, you can infuse, you can integrate as, as much AI as you want. It's not going to work because you, you are not even ready to be using it. So again, back to my readiness point, you know, uh, they were, they were sort of, they were probably blind, blindsided by the fact that AI was going to do things better, faster, etc. Uh, and they were moving, they were rushing directly to the implementation and adoption phase. And they were not looking at their processes to check and to, of course, to adapt them if necessary for the new AI world. And that's for, that's where, you, of course, you you can have some some I would say not just big mistakes, but you can have some real issues in terms of cost and time effectiveness. Because, of course, when you have to justify the cost of AI, which is huge in most cases, uh, you cannot even say, you know, oh yeah, I you know I spent that that amount of money not just to implement it, but to make corrections of what wasn't done before. So it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult discussion at the exec level when you have to sort of present the AI case and make sure that you get more funding because it, AI will, get, will, re, will require more funding uh, along the way. So you just have to demonstrate your quick wins and then you can, you, can, you, know, you can hope that you will get more funding based on the quality of your quick wins. But as long as your processes are not adapted, and that goes from creation to delivery mm -hmm. for AI, I would say just including AI in your supply chain doesn't make sense. Correct. And you, you have a very good point because it has to be a strategy, right? So it cannot be an individual mm -hmm. initiative. It has to be a, a strategy from the top down in any organization, right? And the expected outcome, it's a very important topic because I, you know, I started the conversation by saying I we over exaggerating the benefits of AI and are we ahead of our time in terms of expecting results now versus the results that are coming down the road in a few years from now. And I look around and I see, I hear all the, all the time, you know, big companies, medium sized companies are laying off people. And I don't know if it's connected in some cases to a, a pre, I want to say preset benefit of AI, which hasn't arrived yet. But meanwhile, we, you know, we're, reducing the number of, 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 of staff ahead of our time in some cases, not always, but in, in a lot of cases where you talk about strategy from the top down, it's very important. I would, I would think it's very important to set realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. What is the outcome in a gradual realistic expectation? You know, it's not like I invested a million dollar in AI technology. You know, you're right. There are some quick wins. I can just 
attack now. In the next few months, I can just maybe return that million dollar in terms of investment, but it is not going to return you $10 million immediately. Over time, maybe, but not immediately. I'm assuming, I'm assuming the same thing applies to any investment you do anyway, so. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> absolutely. I totally agree. And I would add for the audience, for the benefit of the audience, that if they want, if they're looking for a framework to, you know, make sure that processes are ready and effective for AI in terms of content management here, I'm talking about generative AI again, you know, for, for, for the localization and, and content industries. I think there is one framework I, I recommend more and more often, which is the LangOps framework. It is, it is a framework that really shows, and you can go to the website called langops.org, you will see that it's, 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 not a, it's not a technology, it's actually a strategic mm -hmm. approach to start changing the way content has been, multilingual content for that matter, has been managed for years, for decades, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, and uh, it's a framework that is interesting in many ways for me, because I used it and I'm still using it. And I think it's also interesting, valuable, because it really helps people who are in charge of AI, you know, implementation, adoption, can be different people, but usually there is an AI champion now in, in some organizations. So for the AI champion, the main, the, the first question might be, where should I start mm -hmm. <laughs> and where should I go? And I think that's, these are two very philosophical questions which is also a matter of survival for these people, because if they're not able to answer those questions, probably the role of AI champion will go to somebody else. And I think that it's really important to frame, as you said, you know, frame the, the strategy mm -hmm. and what LangOps bring. If you go to the website, you will see uh, what is called the manifesto. And you will see that in this manifesto, there are a number of points related to humans, processes and technology. Yeah. <laughs> exactly the combination exactly I just mentioned. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons, yeah, which is one of the reasons why I, I, I like it personally and I sometimes recommend it to other people. Uh, because if you use that frame or you can, you can use your own framework if you want, uh, you are make, you are making sure that first you are going through the steps like audit readiness, effectiveness, and also that you don't lose track of any of the components that you don't sort of you know, you, you, you have to make the balance right between people, processes, and technology. And that you are not, you're not obsessed by technology or you're not obsessed by processes and you leave people behind or, or the opposite. You are, you are totally obsessed by people and you don't care about processes. It has to be yeah. a balance. Uh, and the balance is, can be different in, depending on the mm -hmm. industry. Because, for instance, in regulated industries, to go back to the processes you mentioned, in the regulated industries and life science, which I know, uh, compliance is, of course, a major factor, a major requirement that is not so important in other industries because they are not regulated. So every time you, th you, you, you mention AI, there is immediately, you know, uh, people who are saying, hey, but, you know, what about the compliance? What about the, the, the you know, the, the AI policy? What about the, the governance? That's also part of the processes that need to be, uh, that need to be really calibrated. It's not just the supply chain itself. There is a layer above it, which I call uh, compliance and, go and governance, where you have to say, well, what is, going to, what is going to be necessary for my supply chain to be not just, uh, you know, effective, you know, fast, uh, uh, pro productive, etc., but how is it going to be mm -hmm. safe? For some companies, it's, it's a small requirement. If I'm, uh, you know, if I'm a producer of chocolate, probably, you know, I don't, care so much because there are not so many regulations about chocolate production. But if I'm a, a pharmaceutical company, this is a major requirement. It's even more important than many other ones. And of <coughs> course, AI is a game changer in the process as well, because you look at the supply chain, which is safe today, because it's based on, as I said before, it's based on content in, you know, sort of traditional formats, but you know that you have to be more digital, you have to be more data driven. So you you convert your files, your, you know, for instance, your clinical trial files into data, then of course you have to make sure that the data is as safe or as anonymized, to give an example, as your previous file, as your previous uh, assets like files. So governance and, and, and compliance for me 
are sort of sort of um, the roof of the house called supply chain. So in a in a so my in my understanding from you in a regulated environment there is a possibility of deploying AI <clears throat> big possibility but as mm -hmm. long as you follow the rules basically what you're saying. Yes and and well uh, I'm probably we, sh we shouldn't be too technical but the, one of the reasons why you see today some organizations uh, deciding to create their language models because they don't believe in generalist language models. They want to have custom language models. One of the reasons, it might be cost, of course, sometimes, but one of the reasons I know, because I'm working on the project as we speak now on, on this, is because they want to be safe. They, want, they don't want to find their content in a generalist model uh, because, of course, you know, when it's uh, life science, it's heavily regulated, and you cannot do whatever you want. You have to be not just correct, but you have to be also compliant with all the regulations. And indeed, in that case, it's important to really focus on what's going, what AI is going to be uh, bringing as added right. value, so created value, but without sort of undermining the other work that is done to what that you do yourself, that your company does to be compliant. And it is absolutely possible. And I was reading an article uh, about, um, I think it was JP Morgan. Uh, it was a big, big bank in corporation. And they were explaining they were investing a lot, which is not surprising, but they were investing a lot in creating and internalizing, internalizing, operationalizing AI in house because they wanted to keep control of their data, of their content. Uh, they didn't want to, and maybe, maybe later they might choose to, because that's another, that's another benefit of, of using data instead of files. You can monetize uh, if you want. Uh, I know some organizations will do that. S some content, not, all, not any, any content. But in, in addition to using language data in-house to, you know, to, to, to feed and train the AI, they will be able, of course, in some cases, if they decide to do so, if they, if they are safe enough to monetize this data so that, you know, it can be used okay. by, other organizations like, you know, uh, like, for instance, a market research company, uh, you know, uh, covering the pharmaceutical market, you know, uh, you know, some some pharmaceutical companies might decide to sell some data. I haven't seen that yet, but I'm it sure it, possible, it might be coming. It seems possible. And so that's another way to look at AI. <clears throat> that's my point here is that since AI is forcing you to change your processes, mm -hmm. You have to look at value wherever you want, wherever you right. can. You have to look at value because, of course, you are going to say, I'm going to be more productive. I'm going to be yep. faster. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you know, be, I'm, I'm going to deliver content, better content to my customers. But there are some hidden, uh, sort of value, I would say nuggets, what I call it, um, value nuggets, like, for instance, indeed, how, how can you leverage language data? <laughs> more and better uh, to for, for something that hasn't been done before. Uh, and I have an example, for instance, of a company using language data that is used for AI, but that language data is used by now the UX writers. So people are in the supply chain creating content, but the UX writers can benefit from, you know, the conversion of files into data. They can use that data to be faster in UX. Uh, one year ago, I didn't think about it, but I saw that once and I said, yeah, yep. that makes sense. So it's not even monetization. It is purely leveraging something that is done in the, in the organization for more than just what is supposed right. to be. It done. opens an opportunity for broader use. Uh, that's what you're saying, right? So yeah. um, just a few more minutes, uh, if you don't mind, talk a little bit about technology, technology deployment. Uh, from mm -hmm. a technology perspective, yeah. I feel like you know, the current technology infrastructure that we have, you know, servers, computer rooms, uh, you know, a bunch of deployed um, architecture in a variety of ways. I feel like AI is less of that. I feel AI, it's more a um, uh, less intrusive in terms of less demand on capital assets for companies to buy a new equipment, unless you want to build your own thing internally. If you were using, you know, the publicly available uh, tools, it's less less capital investment. Uh, on that one. And it's, from a deployment perspective, you don't need to buy new computers, new hardware, etc. So again, unless you're building your own. Can you talk a little bit about technology? Uh, well, 
Yeah, it well, uh, it depends. I would say I, I, it depends on, as you said, on how you do it internally or not internally, and it, it depends on your business objective as well. Because you know, originally you're right. Originally, it might be the case. It might be not sort of um, eating, uh, you know, all your budget for you know capital expenses in terms of technology. But as as we said, you know, in the beginning, I think we are in the beginning of the journey. So if you add more and more, or if you extend the scope of AI, then of course you will need to extend your capacity and your scalability. Uh, so it, I would say it depends on what you want to do first. It depends on the speed. Mm-hmm of how you want to grow your AI strategy. Uh, but one thing that I would probably highlight for technology is that I think there is, it's, it's even more important today than maybe five years ago to consider uh, the tech stack, uh, some people call it the tech stack, um, as an ecosystem, as a real ecosystem, as a technology ecosystem. Uh, and the reason why I, I, I believe that is because, first of all, is because I saw that, you know, using um, a, a sort of, uh, you know, a, a series of tools and systems that are not interconnected, that are not compatible, that are not uh, communicating with each other, is it's always possible to do it like that, but it's so cost effective, so so costly and so expensive that, of course, you know, from a tech from a tech or capex perspective, you are you are on the wrong track. So it's really it's really not good. And the, the second reason uh, why it's more important today it's because of AI. AI, as you know, as as we just uh, pointed out, now brings the localization and the content the content industries to the area of content and data services. And since you know, it's not it's no longer just about the transaction of files. It's about now the management of data, which is a totally different thing, then of course the ecosystem has to be able to integrate components that are going to be used to manage that data, to create that data, to curate that data, to annotate that data, to transcribe, you know, from video to text or from voice to text. So there are a number of activities that are related to data, language data, content data that need to be supported by technology. And in a number of cases, some systems, some content management systems or some translation management systems today will have to be, you know, adapted. They have to be upgraded to still be part of the ecosystem. And that's why I think it would be a mis- well, not a mistake, but it would be, it would be counterproductive to keep managing the, the tech stack uh, in, in bits, not in bits and pieces, but separately according to the different components. I think the vision, the view should be on the, um, the, the ecosystem and look at how the component, first of all, if all components are there, then first of all, uh, but that's probably yep. the easiest part is to like, you know, make your inventory of components. But the, the real challenge is to make sure that this ecosystem and all the integrated components mm-hmm. are scalable, transparent, and uh, interoperable so that's really the three things and i think for some organizations it's 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 a major challenge as well because if there is no ecosystem that is going to be supporting uh that's going to be enabling people to follow the right processes then your human and process components will not work either well i uh no this is very valuable very wise and thanks for the uh for the conversation uh today we're coming up to the hour uh bruno this is a topic that we could talk about for a few days, to be honest with you. It's, oh, yeah. a, it's a very interesting and a very exciting topic. It depends on which side of the fence you're on uh, when it comes to that thinking. But uh, to me and to you, um, we feel passionate about this topic. We, we love talking about it. And we've had several conversations over the over this past few months about it. So um, just final thoughts on, uh, on on the conversation today. Anything that you le- you like to uh, recommend for our uh, audience and for the future viewers of this channel on the topic of AI deployment. Uh, my final sentence will be make it value driven and inclusive. Uh, make your strategy, your efforts, your, 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 um, your training, uh, you know, value driven and inclusive, yep. uh, value driven yep. business side, uh, inclusive. Human yeah, absolutely. Side. Absolutely, and Bruno. Like uh, from my side as well, I want to make sure that people understand that 
you know, this is not something scary. This is something really exciting for humanity, for all of us. Uh, it's going to help us quite a bit on a variety of ways. Bring the people along uh, on the journey of adopting AI. Bring them along in terms of training them, in terms of preparing them, in terms of, uh, you know, upskilling them, as, as uh, Bruno said earlier. And on the um, on the expectation side, set your set the bar a little lower than you know aggressive up because that's going to take you a while. Um, co large companies generally don't move don't move quickly; they move slowly. Um, you got to bring you got to keep that in, you got to keep it, that into perspective. So, from me, uh, Bruno, I want to thank you guys for attending. For everybody who has attended today's session, for those of you who did not have a chance to attend. Uh, obviously, LinkedIn will keep that uh, alive a little bit for us. So if you guys want to click on it and click on the episode on the discussion and view it at your own leisure, feel free to do that. Uh, I will be editing and I will be posting this particular episode on our localization fireside channel on YouTube. Please uh, feel free to look us up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And also on a podcast. So this also will be on an, in an audio version as well. Feel free to, chat, to, to um, uh, look us up on your favorite podcast channels, Spotify, Apple, etc. So we look forward, I look forward to having this conversation again with Bruno. Bruno, thanks again. And greetings from Canada Thank and you. Belgium to everybody who attended today. Um, and look forward to seeing you in the future, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you.